Razia Serengeti is going to speak to us on translation and the regulation of the mitochondrial shaping proteins. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for the opportunity to be here and to talk uh, about um, mitochondria. So, um, I was asked not to be too technical and um, I should have brought a picture of a cell for people that are not familiar with, but um, it was too late, uh, so I tried to, um, to refer to this, uh, which is uh, uh, a cell in principle, maybe not the best one uh, you could find. But anyway, we have, we have everything that is in the cell, and I'm going to talk about uh, several organelles. So uh, organelles are uh, inclusions in the cell, like here you see mitochondria, here is the nucleus, and here through all the cell there is an organelle which is called endoplasmic reticulum, and my talk will be also about this one, so keep in mind. And the, in the cell you have a liquid where all the organelles are distributed, and this is called cytoplasm. So just some basics. <laughs> okay, mitochondria, you all have heard uh, uh, a lot about them uh, in the previous talk. Here you see an electron microscopy picture of them, and uh, you have the impression that mitochondria swim in the cytoplasm as single independent units. And this was the old view of mitochondria. But uh, in the last uh, decades, uh, people uh, developed uh, fluorescent proteins that, are, that can be targeted to uh, subcellular organelles with uh, specific tags. And this allows to uh, watch what organelles do in cells, in live cells. So the, what came out from these uh, experiments, here you see a cell in which you have a fluorescent protein targeted to mitochondria. And what happens? Mitochondria move very fast in the cytoplasm, so they are not fixed there as single units, but they are like a network that moves very fast. And under some circumstances, this network gets disrupted. This can be mimicked by using um, uh, drugs like arachidonic acid. So you see that in a time course, mitochondria get progressively cut into small pieces. So, mm, in principle, this view of mitochondria as very, very uh, mobile agents is not that new, because there is a paper in Science from 1914, which show, uh, it's not showing, but talks about uh, uh, watching mitochondria in tissue culture from chicken embryos, and what they say is that they found granules, because at that time not, it was not accepted from everybody to, talk, to call them mitochondria. These granules can be seen to fuse together into rods or chains, and these to elongate into threads, and so on. This, this looks like a network, and this is exactly what I showed you before with the fluorescent proteins. So, Probably uh, 1914 was a bad year to start this, and uh, it took one more century to go back to this uh, living mm, network. Okay, but coming back to our times, this mitochondrial dynamics is observed to be present in a lot of uh, cellular processes, like uh, cell division, so mitochondria needs to be divided in order to distribute them to daughter cells, or in a process that is called mitophagy, which is a process that allows the cell to get rid on, of dysfunctional organelles. 
mitochondria get first uh, cut into pieces and then uh, eaten away. Or even in the process of cell death, the mitochondrial membrane is uh, restyled by changing uh, the morphology of mitochondria, of the inner part of mitochondria, in order to allow for uh, um, death agents to come out from mitochondria. So the question was, what's the machine that is responsible for these morphological changes from fused to uh, fragmented mitochondria? And uh, it was very fast, uh, it became very fast evident that uh, these processes are orchestrated by a family of proteins that is called uh, GTPases, and they resemble dynamine. Dynamine is a protein that uh, is uh, working on the uh, plasma membrane, so the envelope of the cell, and this is responsible for uh, making uh, vesicles out of it. Within the cell, we have different proteins that are responsible for shaping mitochondria. So for fusion, we have mitofusin 1 and mitofusin 2, and for and, uh, OPA1. And for fission, we, th we have the protein DRP1, which in coupled with FIS1 works on mitochondrial disruption. So just a few words on mitochondrial fusion. Uh, the proteins, uh, mitofusin 1 and mitofusin 2, are located on the outer membrane. The mitochondria are, uh, um, are surrounded by two membranes, the outer membranes and the inner membrane. Uh, the mitofusins uh, push the other membranes close, and the two membranes fuse, and we, you have a longer mitochondria. Uh, OPA1 is in the inner membrane, and it helps by this process. Okay, now you can forget about uh, fusion, because my talk will be about fragmentation, so fission. And uh, fission is performed by a protein that is in the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is the liquid that is inside the cell, and uh, the fission protein, DRP1, is cytosolic and only upon stimulation it, it moves from the cytosol to mitochondria, where it docks to a small protein, which is called FIS1, and oligomerizes, this means several proteins work together, and squeezes the mitochondrial membrane, and you have pieces of it. So what is the process that makes DRP1 moves from the cytosol to mitochondria? We observed in the lab that uh, cyclosporin A treatment was able to prevent this movement. Cyclosporin A is a drug that works as an inhibitor of uh, calcineurin, and the calcineurin is a cytosolic phosphatase. A phosphatase is a protein that is responsible for taking away phosphate groups from proteins. So, as you can see here, you see again cells with uh, mitochondria uh, tracked by this fluorescent protein. Mitochondria are fused upon treatment of arachidonic acid that I showed you in the beginning is uh, disrupting mitochondria into small dots. You see passage from fusion to fragmentation. If you pretreat the cells with the cyclosporin A, the inhibitor of calcineurin, you don't see mitochondrial fragmentation. This was uh, an indication that uh, there is a dephosphorylation step that is important for mitochondrial fragmentation to take place. And in fact, what we found is, uh, I did this uh, simplified panel, DRP1 here, the blue dots, is a phosphorylated protein, so it has phosphate groups attached. These phosphate groups are taken away by calcineurin in the presence of arachidonic acid that we show to be able to increase the activity of calcineurin. And this uh, dephosphorylated DRP1 moves to the mitochondrial outer membranes. DRP1 oligomerizes, and you have mitochondrial fragmentation. So this means that DRP1 is a phosphorylated protein, and the dephosphorylation of this protein by the phosphatase calcineurin 
is the signal for the cytosolic DRP1 to migrate to mitochondria and induce mitochondrial fragmentation. Okay, uh, our interest moved to uh, mitochondrial dynamics and disease, and uh, there are a lot of mutations known in fusion proteins in families that uh, lead to disease, in particular mutation in OPA1 lead to o dominant optic atrophy, and there are uh, more than 100 mutations known, and mutation in mitofusin 2 lead to the neuropathy uh, shark marie tooth type 2. So what happens to the RP1? Two different labs try to uh, make mice which are deprived of this protein, and what they saw is that uh, during embryogenesis, the embryos that lack DRP1 are not able to develop. So here uh, you see the embryos. At day 10, the normal embryo is growing and will lead to the normal mouse, while the DRP1 deleted embryo is stuck into a non-developed stage and it dies in utero. To see uh, what DRP1 is doing in the mice uh, anyway, uh, they prepared some engineered mice that uh, produce DRP1 only after birth. And what they saw is that in a normal cerebellum at day zero, the cerebellum looks like this. The cerebellum is a part of the brain. In 12 hours, you see the formation of these folds that allow the surface to get bigger, which is correlates with uh, development. While uh, if you take out the DRP1, you don't have this area increase. This means DRP1 is important for brain development. And DRP1 deficient mice are little. What happens in human? There is only one point mutation that was characterized until now in human, and uh, it affected a baby that uh, died at 30 uh, days of age. And what uh, was found in this baby is that here you see the mitochondria stained with this fluorescent protein. They are much longer than control mitochondria. The same is for peroxisomes. Peroxisomes are, uh, is another organelle of the cell that is responsible for the metabolism of lipids. This phenotype could, uh, could be related to a point mutation in the DNA of the baby. And this point mutation, this means uh, the substitution of a base for another one, this uh, mm, substitution in the bases le uh, was leading to a mm, to a uh, different amino acid sequence in the protein. And this, the amino acid that was substituted was in the middle domain of the protein. The um, function of the middle domain is not known yet, so we were interested in understanding what's going wrong in this uh, mutation. And we prepared several point mutations in the middle domain, and we saw that uh, independent of the point mutation, you see mitochondrial elongation. So this uh, domain is important for uh, mitochondrial fragmentation. To be sure that the, it's really the protein that is uh, uh, not able to fragment mitochondria and not just something else that, going, that is going on in parallel, we checked the mitochondrial fragmentation induced by arachidonic acid in cells that uh, from the mice that were deprived of, uh, uh, from the embryos that were deprived uh, of the DRP1. Here you see over time, cells without DRP1 do not fragment as expected. Cells in which you reintroduce uh, DRP1 undergo fragmentation with time and cells in which you reintroduce the point mutation, 
are not able to fragment. This means this mutation is unable to work uh, to perform our mitochondrial fragmentation. This is a quantification. So uh, the, uh, the question was then, what, uh, which is the impact of this uh, very much elongating mitochondria on the cell function, functionalities? And uh, it, it was published in the lab that uh, mitochondria and ER are taken close together. ER is the endoplasmic reticulum, I was showing you at the beginning. They uh, uh, make uh, close contacts through the fusion protein mitofusin 2. If mitofusin 2 is absent, you have uh, uh, an increase in fragmentation, and this is paralleled by a detachment of mitochondria from the endoplasmic reticulum. So the question was, uh, if we have elongated mitochondria, do, are the contacts uh, do we have a higher number of contacts, or what's going on? And the answer was here, you see cells, these are not mitochondria this time, this are, is the endoplasmic reticulum, because we use a fluorescent protein that is targeted to this organelle. This is a normal cell, and you see the endoplasmic reticulum is distributed within the cell as a network, again, very homogeneous, and it covers all the cell. If you delete DRP1, you see that the network is disrupted. You have like uh, clumps of uh, endoplasmic reticulum, and the reticulum is not homogeneous. This was very interesting. If you reintroduce the, the normal DRP1, the functional one, you reconstitute the network, and if you reintroduce the mutation, you see again that the network is not homogeneous like in the DRP1-deprived cells. Okay, so it was evident that this function of absence of DRP1 results in uh, an altered morphology of the endoplasmic reticulum. So uh, we have an altered morphology, and what about the functionality of the endoplasmic reticulum? We went on to check uh, uh, the main uh, pathway, the pathways that, go, uh, that um, are going on in the endoplasmic reticulum. For example, the endoplasmic reticulum is the main reservoir of calcium of the cell. Calcium goes in through, the, through a pump that is called circa pump, and it goes out uh, through uh, receptors that are called IP3 and rhianodine receptors. And the amount of calcium that is released from the ER is an indication of uh, uh, the ability of the ER to uh, modulate signals, calcium-dependent signals in the cytoplasm. So we measured the amount of uh, calcium that is released in our cells, in the cells from the normal mouse, cells from the mouse deprived of DRP1, cells from the mouse deprived of DRP1 with uh, DRP1 reintroduced or muta uh, mutant DRP1 reintroduced. And what came out is that the endoplasmic reticulum of DRP1 knockout cells contains more calcium than the wild-type endoplasmic reticulum. If you reintroduce DRP1, you go back to the wild type, this means the DRP no normal cells, if you introduce the mutation, you don't rescue the amount of calcium that uh, is in the uh, wild type cells. Okay, so this mutant and uh, the absence of DRP1 impact on the ER calcium levels. Increased calcium levels in the ER are uh, related to a process that is called ER stress. What is ER stress? So, the endoplasmic reticulum is the site in the cell where proteins get modified after translation. This means you have proteins that are 
uh, made up in the cytoplasm, they are transported in the endoplasmic reticulum, and they get pieces attached to them, like mm, glyco gly glycose residues or uh, this disulfide bridge and so on. Uh, if these processes are not working well, they are uh, accumulates proteins that are not finished, and this accumulate, accumulation of unfinished proteins leads to this phenomenon, which is called ER stress. And of course, the cell has a machinery that is responsible to try to get rid of these uh, of these um, uh, bad condition. And this machinery is uh, leading once activated by the unfolded proteins, is leading to the activation in the nucleus of the expression of uh, genes that are responsible for, to, for refolding the protein or uh, um, slowing down production of no new proteins and so on. So there, this is uh, performed through three main pathways, PERC, IRI 1 alpha and ATF6, all of them get activated. It's just a question of time. One gets activated faster than the other one, but they are all active at a, a certain point. So we try to uh, see whether these pathways were active in our cells by inducing uh, uh, ER stress. We used an agent that is inhibiting uh, protein glycosylation, so the proteins do not get uh, glycosylated and they accumulate uh, in the ER and give rise to this unfolded protein response. So what came out is by inducing uh, activation of the unfolded protein response, in the wild-type cells, we see that after treatment, you have an increase in the response. So the cell is trying to restore the normal situation. Surprisingly, in the knockout cells, the cells that do not have DRP1, you have high stress even already at the beginning. So the, the cells are like in permanent stress. If you reintroduce DRP1, the situation is corrected. So before treatment, you don't have stress, and the cell gets into stress after blocking glycolysis, uh, glycosylation. If you reintroduce the mutation, the cells are permanently stressed. We also checked for the presence of um, this protein I showed you that are expressed at a higher level uh, upon uh, uh, st stress. So here, I don't go into detail. If you see a band, this means there is a protein. If you see a very intense band, you have higher presence of the protein. As you can see, this is the protein, the sensor of uh, unfolded proteins. In the normal cells, you have an increase in the expression as it is expected uh, from the activation of the unfolded protein response. In the cells without DRP1, you see that this protein is always expressed. So again, they are in stress. Coming back to uh, DRP1, if you uh, induce stress for a longer time, you observe that DRP1 in green here, you have uh, DRP1 in green and the mitochondria in red. DRP1 moves from the cytoplasm to mitochondria. You see here DRP1 on mitochondria. If you have the mutant in your cells, in green again, the mutant do not, doesn't move to mitochondria. So what's DRP1 doing on mitochondria after induction of ER stress. It is known from the literature that if uh, the cell cannot rescue the situation of normal protein folding in the ER, the cell tries to uh, die. So 
uh, if, this, if the stress is too high, the cell is not working anymore, and the uh, program of cell death is uh, activated, which is called apoptosis. Okay, so here in this panel you see unfolded proteins, you have stress, induction of uh, proteins that try to uh, recover the healthy situation in the endoplasmic reticulum. If you cannot rescue the situation, you induce cell death. So th this is a panel to show you what's going on in apoptosis. Uh, this is a uh, part of mitochondrion, other membrane, inner membrane, and there is a protein within the two membranes that goes out from the other membrane by activation of apoptosis, and this protein starts in the cytoplasm, the signaling cascade that leads to cell death. We have shown uh, previously that uh, this process of apoptosis is uh, inhibited if you uh, take out the RP1. So here we induce uh, apoptosis by a standard agent, which is called starosporin. And you see, over time, apoptosis is activated and mitochondrial fragmentation takes place. If you inhibit mitochondrial fragmentation by this specific inhibitor, you don't have fragmentation and you don't have release of cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is here in green at the beginning before treatment with staurosporin. Cytochrome C is within the mitochondria. Cytochrome C is in green and mitochondria are in red. If the two uh, signals are at the same place, this means uh, cytochrome C is in the mitochondria, you see yellow. When uh, cytochrome C is released, a uh, whole mark of apoptosis, of begin of apoptosis, cytochrome C is released in the cytoplasm. This process is prevented by preventing mitochondrial fragmentation. And the prevention of apoptosis by inhibition of DRP1 is that strong that you can take your cells treated with uh, starosporin, plate them again to grow on a plate, and you see that the cells are able to make colonies again. This means they completely survived the apoptotic attack. Okay. Bottom line, inhibition of DRP1 prevents apoptosis. So coming back to uh, the previous observation, if you induce stre stress for a long time so that the cell is not able to uh, survive the apoptotic, uh, the stress, DRP1 moves to mitochondria. And this is probably related to the fact that DRP1 moves to mitochondria in order to promote apoptosis. So the cell is not able to, uh, is not compatible with life because you have too much stress in the endoplasmic reticulum. So in order to get rid of the cell, you need apoptosis. So you need DRP1 moving from the cytosol to mitochondria. And this is what happens. In fact, if you treat with tunicamycin for a long period of time, like 24 hours, you see the percentage of cells that are alive, that are dead in the wild type, increases by seven times. If you have uh, the knockout cells, you have much less cells that die. So, uh, and the same for the knockout cells with the mutant DRP1. So the apoptotic exit route in these cells is blocked. And uh, our idea is that this leads to the accumulation of cells that are in stress and cannot die. So taken uh, together, if you look at the cells uh, in uh, the, your culture, you have a lot of cells that are in stress in permanent stress. Okay, then, uh, 
since we saw so many effects on, uh, the, uh, on uh, the endoplasmic reticular, we were interested in seeing whether DRP1 is also working directly on the endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, to check this, we take uh, our cells and we separated the cytoplasm from uh, mitochondria and from the endoplasmic reticulum. We did three different fractions of that. You do this by doing several centrifugation steps and uh, the different organelles uh, sediment at uh, different uh, centrifugation speeds. And then you separate your proteins on a, on a membrane and you check for the presence of your protein. So uh, here we have DRP1 in the cytosol, in the mitochondria, in the ER, before and after treatment with tunicamycin for four hours. So this is a mild induction of ER stress. What you can see, DRP1 is, of course, in the cytoplasm. Some, of DRP, some DRP1 is on mitochondria, and you see DRP1 also in the endoplasmic reticulum. This is uh, an observation that is, was not yet done, so it's new. And after treatment with tunicamycin, the amount of DRP1 in the endoplasmic reticulum increases. So DRP1 is going to the endoplasmic reticulum to do something. Interesting, interestingly, FIS1, you remember FIS1, the small protein on the other membrane that, uh, to whom DRP1 is docking, is also present on the endoplasmic reticulum. So probably we have the same uh, pattern of uh, fragmentation like uh, in the ER. Uh, DRP1 docks to FIS1 and do, does something on the endoplasmic reticulum. What happens at six, 16 hours treatment when cells start dying? Uh, sorry, here I... Ah. I didn't uh, put the, but it's the same. Here you have the cytoplasm, here you are mitochondria, and here you have the ER. So let's look at DRP1. At time zero, DRP1 is mainly in the cytoplasm. Time f uh, at four hours, it, it accumulates on the endoplasmic reticulum. 16 hours, it's going to mitochondria to induce apoptosis. So now we have one protein which is not uh, changing uh, con concentration levels in the cell, but it's moving to different organelles and it's performing different and it's promoting different pathways. Uh, so I was thinking uh, about what can this have to do with proteomics because uh, if you make a proteomics of cells that are in stress or in apoptosis or whatever, you always see the same level of DRP1, but actually different things are going on. So maybe we should look at some sort of proteotopomics, so to see proteins and where they are, because depending on where they are within the, the same cell, they may uh, promote different mechanisms. Okay, so summarizing, in the absence of functional DRP1, the, uh, the morphology of the endoplasmic reticulum is abnormal, and this is accompanied, accompanied by altered calcium levels in the endoplasmic reticulum and increased stress levels. And the uh, functional DRP1 moves from the cytoplasm to the endoplasmic reticulum, at the beginning of the unfolded protein response, and then, by unsustainable stress, it moves to mitochondria. Okay, you can uh, understand better than me that this may have a lot of implications for the disease, uh, and uh, what I would like you to remember from this presentation is that there are these pulses in the membranes, in the cell, that uh, so the, the s membranes of organelles are not static, but there is a lot of movements going on, and these movements are related to
to signaling-like pathways just by promoting different mechanisms. Okay, I would like to thank uh, my student, Martina Busbarina, which did uh, a lot of work, and uh, Lucas Corano for financial support and uh, for discussion, and all of you for attention. Thank you. <laughs>